Welcome to this faith thinking event which is on house churches in the first century community in the New Testament. I'm Paul Trebilko from the theology program of the University of Otago. So we're talking about house churches. The word church in the Greek is ecclesia. From this we get the word ecclesiastical, things to do with the church. The basic meaning of the word is a gathering or assembly. Only later does it come to mean the building in which the gathering or assembly takes place. So in 1 Corinthians 1-2, Paul writes to the church or to the assembly of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So he's writing to the gathering of people who are followers of Jesus in Corinth. He's not thinking of a particular building, a church building, but of a gathering of people. Ecclesia is often used in the Greek version of the Old Testament for the assembly of the people of Israel. So Deuteronomy 31, And Moses spoke the words of this song to the very end in the ears of the whole assembly of Israel. So it's a familiar word. The word ecclesia is also used in the Greco-Roman city for the assembly or the gathering of citizens gathered for politics and other reasons. So in Acts 19 we have the riot in Ephesus in the theatre and the town clerk addresses the crowd and he says this, if there is anything further you want to know it must be settled in the regular assembly, ecclesia, for we are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. When he had said this he dismissed the assembly, ecclesia. So it's a familiar word in the environment for a gathering or an assembly. And Paul uses it for the gathering of Christians, the ecclesia of Christians. So where did the early Christian ecclesia, assembly, occur? So we read these four passages which refer to these house churches. Colossians 4, give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church or the assembly in her house. 1 Corinthians 16, the churches, assemblies of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Prisca together with the church, the assembly in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. Romans 16, greet Prisca and Aquila who work with me in Christ Jesus and who risked their necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church, the assembly, in their house. Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church or assembly in your Philemon's house. So in these four cases, it's clear that the Christians gathered in a house, in an assembly in the house. So Brannock writes, the private home afforded a place of privacy, intimacy and stability for the early Christians. So in 1 Corinthians 1, when Paul writes to the church of God that is in Corinth, we're to think of him writing to people in a house, who are gathering, assembling in a house, in a house church. Similarly, Galatians 1-2, to the churches of Galatia, we're to think not of people in buildings, church buildings, but people in houses, in each other's lounges. And so when reading these passages, we need to think of this sort of gathering. We perhaps uh, automatically think of a church building, but that's not the case. They're in somebody's house. Another example from the New Testament that helps us to visualize what's going on is in Acts 20 in Troas and we read this on the first day of the week when we met to break bread Paul was holding a discussion with them since he intended to leave the next day he continued speaking until midnight there were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting a young man named Eutyches who was sitting in the window began to sink off into a deep sleep while Paul talked still longer Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and bending over him took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs and after he had broken bread, 
and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn. Then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. So here we have the Christians gathering on the third floor of a house. Clearly they're in a house, uh, somebody's dwelling, and Paul talks for a long time. Uh, and it's from the third floor that this uh, boy Eutyches falls and is amazingly brought back to life by Paul in a miracle. But here they are again gathering in someone's house. It's important to note that these are not house groups where the church meets on Sundays and then divides up for house groups during the week. That might be a pattern we're used to, but this is the, the house church was the church for its members. So they didn't meet on in any other occasion, on another building or in some other place. The house church was the church for its members. So what might it, a, ch a house church have looked like? What sort of building did they gather in? Well, here is a uh, reconstruction of a, quite a wealthy person's house. If you can see my cursor, here's the dining room. Here is the atrium or the courtyard. Uh, other rooms, the kitchen and so on, a, a, a storeroom or a shop here. Well, they would have gathered in the dining room here. Uh, it's often called a triclinium, three couches. Uh, there'll be three couches in here. Uh, so some would gather here and perhaps in here too. And they could uh, listen to what was going on in the dining room. So that's the sort of house that uh, they might have gathered in, although this is a rich person's house. This is that uh, similar house, uh, this time it's plan, and here we have the street, and they come in here into the courtyard, the atrium, and here is the dining room, the triclinium. So they might gather in this room, uh, and an overflow in here. So that's uh, one possibility, but as I say, this is a wealthy person's house. Now this is another form of house, and again, sorry, this isn't particularly clear, but here is one house. It's called Building 1 on this slide. Here's another house, Building 3. This is from Corinth, and they're first century houses, so we know that they're uh, realistic for the time period. Here's the street. And uh, you come in off here, and these are stoves of some sort. So this, we think this was a butcher's house, and they would have sold meat and cooked meat from here and into here in a, a, a living area and perhaps this is the sort of space Christians might have met in it's about 10 by 5 but this is a two-story house so perhaps they met upstairs where there'd be a similar layout of rooms uh, and this is a much more of a working person's house much more average house so perhaps we should think of Christians meeting in this sort of house Here's that same house, but this time a photo. So here is the oven. Here's the butcher's room. Uh, access from the street is here. And this is uh, some sort of living area next door in the, in the next room. And as I say, there'll be the same floor plan upstairs. They might have met here, or they might have met upstairs. That sort of idea. Well, did they only meet in homes? Well, perhaps not. Uh, in uh, Acts 16, we have this account from Philippi, where uh, Jews meet on a riverbank. On the Sabbath day, we, Paul, went outside the gates by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshipper of God, was listening to us. So here Paul is going to a riverbank to meet Jews, and Lydia is converted. And perhaps the open air on a riverbank is the sort of place where some Christians might have gathered for a house church, a church on the riverbank in this case. Or they might have met in lecture rooms, Acts 19 in Ephesus, when some stubbornly refused to believe and spoke evil of the way before the congregation in the synagogue. He, Paul, left them, taking the disciples with him, and argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So here the Christians seem to be gathering in some sort of lecture hall. In this case it's for evangelism, but perhaps they might have met in the same uh, space, the same lecture hall for worship as well. But there are other places too. 
they meet in workshops and warehouses, hotels, inns, rented dining rooms, gardens, watersides, open spaces, burial sites. So particularly in the second century and onwards we have evidence for Christians meeting in all these sorts of places. So predominantly in houses but not only houses. Christians first owned special buildings in the late second century. So from uh, the 30s right through to the end of the second century, 170 years, something like that, Christians just met in houses and sometimes in these other spaces too. So meeting in a house, what would the services have been like? Well look at these passages, 1 Corinthians 14. What should be done then my friends, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Or Ephesians 5, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to God. 1 Timothy 4, until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. So here's a range of what happened in the house church. Notice the emphasis on participation, on each one has a hymn, or admonish one another. It obviously involves everyone. Uh, they're in somebody's lounge, predominantly, and so there's no back row. There's no place where people will sort of uh, hide from everyone else. It's participatory. People are involved, people are engaged, and different ones might sing a hymn or give a lesson or a, a revelation or an interpretation uh, and so on. So uh, it's very much uh, in a lounge with everyone involved. We also have interesting evidence from Pliny the Younger who's uh, a Roman and he writes to the Emperor Trajan around 111. He's not a Christian, but he writes of Christian gatherings. And he says this, They were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft or adultery, not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. When this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. So notice that they're meeting uh, on a fixed day. We'll suggest in a minute that's Sunday. Before dawn, perhaps a number of them were slaves and uh, before dawn was the time when they could get away. Again, we see them singing a hymn, in this case, to Christ as to a God very high view of Jesus. There's obviously some teaching going on and they bind themselves by oath. That's uh, a very strong ethic. Uh, and they share food uh, at some other meeting. They depart and then assemble again to partake of food. Uh, we'll talk about that again in a minute too. Well, 1 Corinthians 16. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside and save whatever extra you can. So Paul is talking about them gathering on the first day of every week, the Sunday. Uh, they gathered on the day of resurrection. Well, another thing they did was to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is part of their worship, but notice that it's also in the context of a meal. We know this from 1 Corinthians 11. So Paul writes this to the Corinthians. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What, do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. And then he gives us the account of the words of institution uh, of Jesus um, breaking bread and sharing the cup on that uh, uh, last supper of Jesus, which clearly they are sharing. But notice that they are doing so in the context of a meal. So Paul's telling them off because some seem to be bringing the, their own food and those who are wealthy have much more food and some who are very poor have no food at all and they go hungry. Someone drinks too much. Uh, 
so he's telling them off because they should be sharing these things uh, but notice the context is of sharing a meal together and this makes absolute sense doesn't it because they're in somebody's lounge they're sitting around a table sharing food together and in that context they share the Lord's Supper so some more details how many people were there in a house church well that depends on the size of the house so that wealthy person's house I showed you uh, first that might have accommodated 30 or 40 but that's uh, probably quite unusual that anyone in uh, the group would have a house as big as that would be as wealthy as that perhaps it was more like 15 10 to 15 in the uh, butcher's house that I showed you from Corinth so what happened when the number of Christians grew well you'd end up with two house churches or three house churches so they would be dividing well who would have led the house church well there would have been shared leadership often by the couple whose house it was so it would be quite natural when it came to the Lord's Supper that the host would be the people who owned the house so look at 1st Corinthians 16 Aquila and Prisca together with the church in their house Aquila and Prisca would be the ones who are presiding leading uh, the service and leading the uh, the Lord's Supper because it's their house Romans 16 again uh, same couple Prisca and Aquila uh, greet also the church in their house they are in Rome by this time and again they have a house church they would be the natural hosts for that house church or Colossians 4.15 give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house so here Nympha a woman would be leading this church there's quite a strong place for women's leadership in these churches but all leadership seems to be shared there'd be a number of people who are involved in leadership in a short form of words the Lord's Supper was celebrated in house churches since at this stage the Lord's Supper was a full meal and since there is no hint in the two places where Paul speaks of it that the management of the meal was in the hands of an official of any kind the people in whose house it was held probably made the arrangements for the meal and had presiding roles over the Lord's Supper another interesting point comes from Romans 16 where Paul gives greetings to people he knows in Rome so first of all greet Prisca and Aquila who we've been talking about greet also the church in their house verse 5 so that's one house church but look at verses 14 and 15 greet Ace and Critus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas and the brothers and sisters who are with them that sounds like a house church greet Philologos, Julia, Nerus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them that sounds like another house church and there are a number of other people he greets who perhaps made up other house churches so perhaps in Rome there were five or six different house churches when Paul writes Romans around 55 and in fact in Romans Paul never writes of the Church of Rome probably because they never all gathered as one community and so they don't ever form one gathering one church so Romans 1 7, to 1, 7 he writes to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be Saints grace to you notice he doesn't say to God's church in Rome because they never gather together and that helps us to understand Romans 12 to 15 where there seem to be some different practices amongst different Christians they were in a number of different house churches so it seems there could be a number of house churches in a city I've just mentioned that about Rome but look at Corinth as well Romans 16 23 Gaius who is host to me and to the whole church greets you so in Corinth Paul is writing Romans from Corinth they seem to be able to all get together perhaps Gaius has a particularly big house so there are a number of house churches in Corinth it seems but the whole church does get together at least at some point so on some occasions the whole church came together on other occasions believers probably met in separate house churches so in some places Rome Ephesus as the number of Christians grew all the house churches probably never met together so theological differences or diversity probably grew fostering a unity overcoming differences in this sort of situation where they never got together as one 
assembly would be quite challenging. Well, another issue is how did the early Christians address one another or refer to one another? The word Christian is only found three times in the New Testament. It doesn't become more popular till the second century. Uh, we might call each other Christians or perhaps Anglican or Presbyterian or Catholic or Pentecostal and so on. Uh, how did they address one another? The most common word used as a term of address or as a self-designation in the New Testament is Adelphoi. That's the plural of Adelphos and Adelphoi means brothers and sisters. So that's the most common way in which they spoke to one another or about one another. And the predominant sense of Adelphoi is as a term for Christian or fellow believer. It's used 271 times in the New Testament with that sense in all New Testament books except Titus and Jude. So just some examples of that. 1 Corinthians 1. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But later on, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. Or 1, Timothy 4, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Now concerning love of the brothers and sisters, Philadelphia love of the brother or sister. Uh, we get the name Philadelphia from that. Uh, you do not need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. So the way in which they addressed one another or referred to one another was as brothers and sisters predominantly. Why? Well, house churches promoted the ethos of the family. So they're sitting around in each other's dining room. They're sitting around in the family gathering space. So it made very good sense that they would call each other brothers and sisters. They're in the house, the family. There are strong theological reasons too. Romans 8.29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God's Son, Jesus, in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn within a large family, literally among many brothers and sisters. So Jesus, the Son of God, has made believers his brothers and sisters through their redemption, through their salvation, that he might be the firstborn within this large family of brothers and sisters. So note the intimacy, the belonging of a family, uh, caring and sharing and loving one another. Of course at times families can disagree and there is that going on in the New Testament and we shouldn't overlook that too. But house churches could also go off the rails theologically. They are just uh, fairly autonomous groups that meet in somebody's lounge and so they can go off the rails. They can go into different ideas that uh, are losing um, the heart of the faith. So look at 1 Timothy 1. I urge you, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia, Paul writing, to remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach any different doctrine and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculation rather than the divine training that is known by faith. Well, later verses 19 and 20, by rejecting conscience, certain persons have suffered shipwreck in the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander. So the suggestion here is that Hymenaeus and Alexander are house church leaders. These are the certain people who are teaching different doctrines. And as Paul writes, he's very concerned that they've gone off the rails theologically. And that's a vulnerability of a house church, that it might go off the rails theologically. How does Paul respond? Well, he seeks to more established leaders be appointed. So in Titus 1.5, I left you behind in Crete for this reason, so that you should put in order what remained to be done, and should appoint elders in every town. So here, elders, more established leaders, are being appointed as a way to counter going off the rails theologically. Also, we see the development of a creed. So 1 Timothy 3, perhaps our earliest creed. Without any doubt, the mystery of our religion is great. He, 
Jesus was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. So here is the development of a, a mini creed which helps the house church to stay on the rails theologically. This is what we believe. This is what we're on about. Also, we see the faith being spoken of as a deposit to be handed on. 2 Timothy 2. You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. We get the sense of what is believed as a deposit to be handed on from Paul to Timothy to faithful people who teach others. Another way of countering the vulnerability that house churches might go off the rails theologically. Another potential weakness of the house church is that it might be insular and inward looking. Was that the case? Well, no. We get a strong sense of mission and we get a strong sense of the network of house churches. Uh, the exchange of letters by Paul and others like First Peter are across the network linking house churches together so they are not insular. There's a lot of mobility of people and ideas. Early Christians are traveling a great deal. But we also get that sense of being part of a worldwide movement. Look at these verses that show that. 1 Corinthians 1, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are linked to Christians all over the place. Romans 1, 8, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. Colossians 1, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit amongst yourselves. The gospel has been bearing fruit in the whole world. 1 Peter 5, resist him steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. So we get a strong sense of networking, of being connected to a worldwide movement. This overcomes any sense of insularity or inward lookingness. But in addition, they're also not insular or inward looking because they're open to outsiders entering their gathering. So look at this, 1 Corinthians 14. Tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is not for unbelievers but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy, an unbeliever or outsider who enters is reproved by all and called to account by all. After the secrets of the unbeliever's heart are disclosed, that person will bow down before God and worship him, declaring, God is really among you. So Paul presupposes here that outsiders will just wander in. Unbelievers, people who haven't uh, converted to faith in Christ, will just enter the building. And you can think of that as a house that opens onto the street. And people might hear them singing and just come in. Or it might be part of a shop that they're meeting in. Uh, they just wander in. So they're not insular because there are uh, unbelievers or outsiders joining them. And in this case, Paul rejoices that they are convicted by prophecy and become Christians. And then my final slide. Why were they not insular or inward looking? Well, there are strong theological reasons for that too. New creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. So there was that sense in that what had happened in Christ was that a new creation had come into being. So they weren't just insular, they weren't just concerned about themselves, but about all of creation. Similarly, Paul talks about uh, the first Adam and Christ as second Adam. So his work, Christ's work, is humanity-wide, Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. Not just for their small group, but for all of humanity. Christ is Lord of all, Acts 10. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And the message is for all. Galatians 3. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus.
the message is not just for a particular group, but for all ethnicities, for slave and free, for men and women. That sense of being for all uh, meant they were not insular or inward looking. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, talk and thank you for uh, listening. Bye for now.